back to another episode of the Saints FC podcast hosted on the Ugly Insides YouTube channel. This week, John is joined by both James and Tom as they discuss their trip to Selhurst Park in the victory against Crystal Palace and their loss at St. Mary's to Manchester United. Featuring in this episode is the celebration of Stephen Davis making his 200th appearance for Southampton, accompanied with a goal from open play as Saints edge past the Eagles and with their new manager, Roy Hodgson, in the dugout. The boys also discuss the impact of the new signings, Mario Lamina and Wesley Hoot, after making huge impressions against Palace, especially Lamina capturing man of the match. Just how good is Mario Lamina is one of the topics, as well as what is Dutch for ping, as Hoot pings some beautiful 40-yard passes with his left foot. They try to work out if Saints deserve to lose to Manchester United or if they were robbed by the officials once again. Is Lukaku a bully? Is Wesley Hoot strong enough? What is it about Saints' chances that mean they don't look like scoring? All to be discussed, as well as a brief look at Saturday's upcoming trip to Stoke City, and they try to work out why Rory's elapsed throw-ins were deadly for Stoke but not for Saints, and look ahead to a crucial run of games in five matches this autumn. And a bonus subject, of course, as they review your suggestions for who Saints' most underrated player, past or present, is, and choose their favourites. So make sure you go ahead and leave your comments in below of this video. Head over to iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts or click in the eye in the corner of this video to download. So less of my waffle. Over to the guys for this week's episode. To Stokes, he's on side. One nil. Here's Sims. It's a good search this from Southampton. They could finish the job here. It's Shane Long and he has done it. Just a minute to play. First stoppage time. Here's Letizia. Right, well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of the Saints FC podcast. Uh, I am here, and alongside me, I have two co-presenters today. So, uh, firstly, we've got Mr. Tom Parker, am I right? Good evening, everyone. And we've got Mr. James Bailey, my brother, who, who stepped in for Tom when he was away the other day. Welcome hello. back, James. Hello. Good to see you both. Um, I, of course, am uh, John Bailey. And if you want to get in contact uh, with the Saints FC podcast, you can do that on Twitter at Saints FC podcast. Send us an email, saintsfcpodcast at gmail.com. Or you could just go onto the iTunes store and leave us a wonderful five-star review with lots of glowing remarks and comments about how, how much you adore this. That, that is always welcome. Um, so, Tom and James, let's pick up kind of where we left off last time. Um, and... The game that we had that came soonest after our latest podcast was against Palace. Yeah, we, it was, uh, despite the restricted view, which as we were saying, I think everyone away fan at Palace has some form of restricted view. We won and we scored a goal from open play. Incredible scene. Stephen Davis looked more shocked than anyone uh, that he actually scored. It was yeah, amazing. I mean, the, we, we've just looked back at some of the photos of uh, him immediately after the goal. He looks delighted, surprised. Was he as surprised as we were? I mean, I think um, the podcast before, we were talking about what's gone wrong at Saints. We couldn't figure out why we hadn't scored a goal. We literally just, you know, kind of settled into your, I would say your seats at Palace, but I think we were all standing for the entire duration of the game, as were all the away fans. Just kind of settled in and bang, we, you know, there was a goal after, what, five or six minutes? Yeah, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, I mean, I I found it like really surprising, and I'm I celebrated that goal pretty hard. Yeah, I think as well. You thought that Palace might be there for the taking, yeah, uh, and you hoped that an early goal would just t- completely take the wind out of their sails, um, which it kind of did. I think Fraser had to make two very good close up saves, um, but they they were there for the taking, and they looked pretty dull and uninspired. Um, it was a really good day out. Um, and I think it was a very exciting day out because I think we're going to come on to talk about two other players that the new players that day. Yeah. Well, let's before we move on to 
uh, two new players. I think we should have a bit of a special mention for Stephen Davis. It was his 200th appearance for the Saints. That's, that's quite a stint he's had for us now. So 200 appearances and he celebrated it with a goal, which I think may have been his first goal for Saints since the two that he got against Tottenham at White Hart Lane. Yeah, or Palace. Is, I can't remember. Oh, or maybe it was Palace, yeah. I can't remember. But he doesn't score. He's one of those players where you're baffled because he does incredibly brilliant technical things with the ball. Uh, like fantastic control, lovely flicks, lovely like chips. And then you're baffled that he can't hit the target. It's a bit like James Ward Prowse. Can't hit the target from 15, 20 yards. Uh, so he should have scored a lot more goals. But whenever he scores, it's good. Like Man City was good. That Chelsea away game in our 3-1 is good. Spurs away. He scores important goals. Yeah. Uh, looking at his stats here, um, I think he scored 12 goals for us in total from from all of those appearances. Um, you know, which it does seem pretty crazy. I think he's, you know, he's, he scores for Northern Ireland probably more than he does um, for us, which is pretty mad. Um, but, you know, there you go. And, uh, you know, well done to him and a great way of celebrating his 200th um, appearance. And it was a really well-worked goal, I thought. He was instrumental in the build-up. A lovely sort of disguised pass since Tadek, who for once beat his man for pace, lashed it across. And uh, yeah, it was a good goal. And I think on match of the day, they said, oh, to the tap-in. But I actually think that was a hard goal to score. Yeah, because it kind of hit, bounced back at him. The ball was an awkward height. He had to find the opposite corner. I don't think it was as easy a tap-in as people made out. So well done, Stephen Davis. Yeah. What, what do you remember of the that goal, James? Um, I don't know. I just remember only just settling down and then... <laughs> And then suddenly going crazy. Yeah, yeah, it was it was great. You know, I think um, we did some good stuff down that down that right wing of of Tadic's during the whole game, and um, and really the first or second attack that we did down that way, we got we got the goal which won the game. Yeah. Um. So I just I just think that let's um let's get on to some of the star players of the game. So. I'm going to kind of save the best for last. So I'm going to start with our new signing, Wesley Hoot, who I thought had a really, really strong game for us. My girlfriend's favourite. He's You're, a handsome man, isn't he? He's just a specimen of it. A, <laughs> Tom, we're, we're always talking about Wesley Hoot's looks. Can we talk about his football for once here? But yeah, but then you saw like, he was so good. He's got this rocket, has not he, of like a left foot that's like a just like a mortar he just fires it and it just fizzes across at a perfect height where no one else could head it and it just lands i, I just such a beautiful bit of football to watch I, d- I did overhear another saints fan in the stand saying what is the dutch word for ping because <laughs> of the way he was pinging the ball off his left foot so nicely um and it, you know it, it was it was a joy to see like he he was able to find kind of Tadic. Um, it was mostly Tadic because they're going across mm, the field yeah. from the left of um, the kind of defence up towards Tadic. He was working pretty well on the right-hand side, looking pretty effective. Um, he also looked pretty strong in defence as well, I thought, Wesley Hick. And no doubt that some of this, um, you know, the the strong performance and the effort being put in by Wesley and by um, Mayo Shida has got to be because Van Dijk is now back on the scene, but he's actually being kept out of the side. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I guess though, I think Van Dyke might still be unfit or still going around the changing room apologising to people. So you never know. It might just. It's, I think it's still just going to be a matter of time for Van Dyke to come back yeah. in. Well, they're, they're talking about this five-three-two formation, aren't they? Which would kind of make sense with Hoyt on the left, Van Dyke in the centre, and maybe Yashid or Stevens on the right-hand side. Um, then that utilizes the width much more of Bertrand and uh, and and Cedric. Cedric. So we'll see. We'll see. But then obviously you have to lose a player, and who do you lose? Yeah, I I think that is certainly at the back of his mind. I think that's why we signed, you know, the two centre backs. We kept hold of uh, Van Dyke. I think that is in the back of um, Pellegrino's mind is is to go to a three or five at the back formation, which does use Bertrand and uh, Cedric as the kind of a, a attacking wing backs. Um, 
I'm not always convinced by that formation. I know we tried it out against Wolverhampton Wanderers and we were pretty poor, but it was with the wrong sort of personnel, I think. So, yeah, may- maybe we'll see that, but maybe it'll just be a case of we'll have um, Yoshida, Stevens, Hoot and Van Dijk battling out for those two places at the, in the middle of the centre of defence. Yeah, but, and, uh, and I think to that point, you, you'd be surprised if Van Dijk stays past January. Um, so... You know, maybe we've just got a, uh, you know, an embarrassment of riches at the moment. Then we'll normal form will be resumed, uh, sort of February time. Yeah. Well, we'll probably sell. Um, let's say we sell Van Dyke, and then two of them will get injured, and we'll be thinking, oh, okay, here we go again. <laughs> right. So let's let's move on to our next new signing because uh, for me, this man was man of the match, and he absolutely bossed the midfield. Mario Lamina was an absolute joy to watch against Palace. Yeah, I don't think I've seen a Saints player play so well. Like, no, it sounds melodramatic. Like, he was so good. He was so dominant, so clever, so strong, um, and just has that sort of extra bit where he not only gets us out of trouble, but then looks up and distributes the ball really well. And again, I wonder if they do go to 5 3 2 with someone like that, you know, if you've got the pace that we've got on the wings, that would really scare people. Yeah. So with Lamina in the middle, kind of like charging from box yeah, to box, pinging out. Yeah, you can sort of wonder like Lamina and, right, and yeah. Lamina Romeo breaking up yeah. play, uh, dropping in a sort of auxiliary centre backs if they have to. Uh, yeah. I don't know. It, it, he he just was there. Someone posted a photo of a, on Twitter afterwards of him and a tank. They said, "Tell the difference." Yeah. <laughs> you couldn't. He was amazing. So James, what what do you remember about Super Mario's performance? Um, one of my highlights of his performance was definitely. He has this move where he sort of just taps it from the right foot to the left foot and he's just gone past a player and the player's just standing there going, sorry, what? Yeah, with with the drop of the shoulder. And it's totally unexpected as well. I mean, that was, it was great to see that because you, you saw him kind of like charging down, robbing the attacker of the ball, you know, somehow kind of coming out of the tackle, still standing up and then suddenly pulls off this piece of skill, which makes the next player who he's taken on just look like a complete fool. But to win the ball back and take it round a player and then distribute the ball. Well, he's like Wanyama, like the T1000 ver- version of Wanyama, <laughs> isn't he? Because Wanyama could always win the ball, but yeah. then you could never really do anything with it beyond the very much basic He wasn't thing. great at passing, was he, Wanyama? No, but whereas Melamina just seems to have the complete package. And I think, yeah, you'll probably see him drive on a score yeah, three or four, hopefully, this season. Yeah. He looked awesome and, yeah, brilliant to watch. He's, he's kind of like, yeah, the Morgan Schneiderlin meets Victor Wanyama and looks a bit like Paul Pogba. Yeah. Um, and he's got a few tricks in his box as well, which, you know, like James was saying, with that kind of little left to right foot and the drop of the shoulder and he's gone round a player. He um, doesn't foul, Peter. That was the, he doesn't foul either. Like, very clever. He didn't take well, away many fouls. No, I, I, I think that's part of it. Like the way he tackles, he's staying on his feet and he just he just gets the ball. He focuses on that. He manages to stay on his feet. He must be really, really strong, I think. And fantastic balance, but really, really good to watch. And I think the Saints fans sang that new Mario Lamina song pretty much the entire duration of the game. Yeah, and five minutes after the game as well. Yeah, and there was a pretty boisterous group of, uh, you know, it's it sound very old, young Southampton fans uh, at half time at the bar. They were really going for it. I think he's a new, <laughs> new cult hero. Um, so, you know, there we go. We've won 1 0 against Palace. Were there any kind of, you know, we've talked about lots of the good things about the game. Were there any things that concerned you about this game? Uh, I, it's Nathan Redmond still. He just doesn't really look. At the races, it doesn't. I have big concerns about Nathan Redmond. Yeah, I I agree that the left hand side of the pitch really had nothing going down it for most of that game. The other thing was just, although we scored within seven minutes, we then didn't really create that many clear cut chances, and it's it's just every game it seems to be like this. Just not enough clear cut cut, cut chances. You want to you want the other team's goalkeeper's hands to be stinging at the end of the match, and I don't think we've done that done that yet, really. Apart from maybe Swansea, but even then, we don't even got a couple on target even then. Yeah, I, I I agree that the left side looks concerning because I think towards the end of last season, you had Bertrand and Redmond were linking up pretty nicely. Um, but and and you know, Redmond showed that he could score some goals as well. He could chip in with a couple of goals. 
and I, I think his confidence must be down. There, there is something wrong there because he maybe seems to be trying a bit too much when he gets the ball. Um, or then, you know, when you'd expect him to try something, not doing it at all, which just kind of, it tells me that's, that's a player. He's kind of lost his confidence, but he's a bit unsure in himself, whereas normally they just kind of do that stuff on instinct. But I wonder as well if, uh, you know, we've spoken a few times on the podcast about science and players, um, maybe not having a real competition. And we spoke about Fraser, you know, not really, no matter what he does, he can't get dropped. And you do wonder, like, uh, with um, Buffal not even on the bench uh, mm. uh, on, against Manchester United, you know, Redmond must look around to that and go, well, you know, I can't really, what's going to happen to me? I'm always going to play. And that's probably not the kind of attitude you, you want from your players. Yeah. Um, so let's let's move on to Saints Man United then. Um, I've got to admit, I wasn't feeling confident about this game going into it. I pretty much thought the best that we could get against Man United would be a nil-nil draw. Um, I didn't expect us to score. And in the end, we lost 1-0. But perhaps a nil-nil would have been a, a fair result. Um, what, what did you make of the game, guys? Um, well, I I only caught a bit of the game, but um, I saw the Man United goal. I thought it was... Uh, firstly, I thought Lukaku fouled Hoot before, um, before the cross went in, gave him a shove. And it's the only thing I can really... Um, complain about Hoot and all of his performances is that his reaction to this shove was to do some sort of weird crouchy thing just crouching on the floor when when the cross went in and Lukaku basically had a free header he almost and, kind and of fell thought, over he, like, yeah, like he tripped over or something it was a bit weird it's sort of like he thought the ball had been crossed acro- along the ground or something it's so, a, I found the Manchester United goal strange and the first thing I thought is oh Wesley who has let himself be bullied by Lukaku there. Um, then I saw the replay of the goal and I thought, well, actually, you know that that was a clear foul because before the cross comes in, Lukaku gives Hoot a, a big shove. He stumbles about three or four yards, um, kind of gets back onto his feet, but then doesn't really get into Lukaku's face in the way that you'd want your central defenders to be in Lukaku's face, and then. You know, Lukaku just wins that header really, really easily. Fantastic stop by Fraser Forster. Thought he did did really, really well to stop that. He's very good at those kind of point blank range um, shots. As he was against Palace. Yeah, as he was. He made two great saves against Palace as well. Um, And then Lukaku was just quickest to the return, wasn't he? You know, Yoshida was there, but I don't know. I think Lukaku was always favourite to win that ball. And that's why Man United pay all, all, all that money for him. Yeah, and I think we, um, by all accounts, I and mean, again, I you know, I have to confess, I wasn't there. I listened to the game on Solent Sport. Um, we we seem to give them a really good game. I think not many teams have done that to Man United this year. Stoke obviously held them, um, and they're the only team I think to to have, to have held them to anything. So I think whilst we lost, by all accounts, the players did really well. Yeah. Um, I mean, Jose Mourinho was pretty complimentary about Saints, saying that that was their first kind of real test of the season. Um, I mean, obviously taking anything uh, Jose Mourinho says without huge pinches of salt and pepper and whatever else you want to season your uh, bullshit with, (laughs) um, you know, you've got to be careful. But he doesn't normally give out you know, that many compliments to opposing teams. I think maybe he was trying to cover for Man United being a little bit disappointing. But actually, I thought the way Man United played, played. I, I remember in the build-up to their goal, they pinged the ball around uh, the midfield, just kind of waiting for the opportunity to come. And they're very, very good and very, very quick at passing the ball and very purposeful as well. And, you know, I think that's the kind of difference between like a Man United and us. You know, when we get to that final third we seem to struggle to find the movement or to beat the person or, you know, create something, you know, when you've got kind of like eight against eight and it's in the final third, like you've, everyone's pushed up. Mm. Man United are able to kind of unlock that. And we're, uh, we're the not quality of the crossing as well. If you look, they've got young and, and Valencia on the wings. Mm. You've got fantastic crosses. And I, I was there with genuine target man. In Lukaku, who is as big, as strong, and can jump as well as anyone. And I think we, you know, we kind of, we play with the system with wingers. Uh, Shane Long is 
brilliant in the air, but mm. he's not particularly big and he's deceptively strong, but he's no Lukaku. Gabby Dini is, it doesn't seem to be built to play in the air at all. Yeah. And Charlie Austin can't get on the pitch. So, um, it, it's weird because we play a system to cross the ball, but we don't seem to have the quality both in the cross or up front to, to score goals like that. Yeah. It's sort of like we're like ask, like dying for this sort of player to just sit in that sort of advanced midfield position and just play beautiful through balls or and like do get these passes that will unlock and this movement that will unlock the defenses when they put six, seven, eight players in front of the goal between you know between the ball and the goal. Um but that player who sits in that position, that that number ten role I suppose is Stephen Davis. And um, I, I do like Stephen Davis. <laughs> but yeah he, he's not that sort of player is he necessarily uh, I mean he he can be at times but I, I think you know it probably is worth talking about Shane Long because he came in in the game against Palace and he showed a lot of industry he ran around a lot as you always get from Shane Long and actually I think he was worthy of his starting position in the game against Man United again um, despite the fact that Gabbiadini had you know a great record against Man United last season clearly enjoys scoring against them um but it, it is funny with Shane Long playing that role because he chases everything. He makes bad passes look good. He gets to the ball you know, more often than you'd expect. And I think that is almost where you're so desperate to have another player, whether it's Stephen Davis or Redmond or Tadic, kind of following up and chasing in after Shane Long and waiting mm. for that kind of like second ball, that spill, that, you know, mistake from a defender. That's that's when it would be most effective. And we didn't really do that. I think in the Palace game, you saw everything that is brilliant about Shane Long. Yeah. Uh, apart from, you know, goal, you saw that he is a complete nightmare. You're exactly right. There is no such thing as a bad pass. There's no such thing as a wasted pass. All of a sudden, a long ball from the back is actually a, a chance to do yeah. something because he is very strong. He does hold the ball well. Um but he obviously is devoid of confidence. I think Dave Merrington was saying he's got like three Premier League goals in his last 18 appearances. You know, he is not uh, the deadly striker because we don't, we need a deadly striker. Yeah. Uh, but those are few and far between and Shailon for all his merits and all his talents is not that. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we did sell one striker over the summer and shipped out our supposedly young, talented Sam Gallagher. And didn't bring anyone in. And I do feel like the it's almost like because we haven't actually changed anything in the in the advanced part of the pitch, you know, in the attacking sense, all of the all of the Premier League teams that we come up against, they're like, Okay, Southampton, well, we know we know how they set up their forward line because they're setting it up exactly the same as they were last season. And we've worked at and we'll work out something in training to deal with it. And there's no there's no surprise. There's nothing to say, like to, you know, you don't see managers changing stuff up to try and deal with us because they already know from the start what we're going to do. And it's, yeah, it's just a lack of um, like innovation almost to, uh, to how, um, how we're actually approaching these games. You think we'd, how many games have we gone? Mostly not scoring now, like a dozen. Well, at home, it's something like nine and 11 or something insane that we haven't scored. It's, I mean, it's a pretty terrible record. Um, and But it is interesting because despite, you know, I think doing quite well against Palace and feeling like Saints play quite well, and despite playing, you know, pretty well against Man United, the chances um, you kind of looked at, and like, that some, you know, there were some good half chances and there were some things where on another day you probably would put them away. But it wasn't like we had five or six chances in both games where you thought, oh, we really, really should have scored there. It was, it was, you know, close, but not, you know, necessarily where you'd expect us to get a goal. We don't seem to really force goalkeepers to make saves. No. Do we? You know, we kind of hit things straight at goalkeepers. We hit things just wide. We smash things over. You don't often like see us like make a goalkeeper. I mean, the, the Redmond shot against Man United was good. Um, you know, forcing the hair down to, to the, to the post but you don't see us really force goalkeepers into making world class saves I, I would say Redmond's probably the the, the biggest uh, um, 
I suppose, perpetrator of this. But you see him in training, um, you know, putting the ball in the top corners, you know, in the bottom corners. About the training videos, John. And, and, um, but it, in the games, he always puts it straight at the keeper. Or, or somehow the Saints players just don't seem to be able to hit the ball as hard as other players in, in the in the league. You know, when you watch... Um, yeah, even players like, you know, Gilfie Sigurdsson or Christian Eriksen, who are quite slight looking players, they seem to be able to absolutely ping the ball off like, with a lot of speed. And yeah, kind of when Redmond hits it, when Tadic yeah, hits it's, it, it's confidence, isn't when it? Davis it's, hits it, it it's never you, rockets off, does it? If you look at the last probably 300 Premier League games that Davis, Tadic, the three players yeah. that Dav- Davis, Tadic and Redmond have, have played, if they have between them scored more than... You know, and I'm talking about yeah, the last 300 games between them. If they between them have scored more than 30 Premier League goals, 35 Premier League mm. goals, I'll be amazed. In yeah, the, and those are three advanced players, two of which essentially play as sort of forwards. Yeah, uh, they just don't score. We the only thing they you watch Ericsson's goal on Saturday. That ball drops. He has the self belief and the confidence. He doesn't whack it. He just places it through a crowd of players mm. into the bottom corner. Saints players. Davis's goal aside seem to completely lack any composure. It's very worrying. Yeah. It's it's gotta change though at some point, hasn't it? It will, otherwise they'll get relegated. Yeah. It's yeah. not scoring goals. Or we might break some awful record of like the highest finishing team to score less than forty goals <laughs> well, in, yeah. in a season, which I think is something that we could really, really It's good to have targets in life. <laughs> See I <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's there's some incredible stat about Tony Pulis when he got um, Stoke promoted because I think they came up a couple of divisions under him and I think they managed to get promoted. It, it may not have been with Stoke, but I think, I'm pretty sure it was Tony Pulis, but they managed to get promoted with a team that scored something like 49 goals in a season, which was only three more than the team that finished bottom of the table with like 46 goals. <laughs> so, I mean, it's it's possible and maybe this... Yeah, I think, Tom, you mentioned uh, last season, jokingly, oh, you know, Saints have transcended football, you know, goals are old news and, and this is how we play now. We're just going to scrape in one every now and then, but essentially we're just, we're not going to concede many. And I, I think you've got to say, actually, conceding only one goal to Manchester United, who have been rampant this season, has got to bode well. We don't look like we're going to concede many goals this season. Yeah, I, th- I think we've had one, I think if you really look at it and you, you're, your objective, I think we've had one difficult, one disappointing result, which is Watford. Mm. The rest, I don't think you can really look at and grumble too much. Um, you know, we, we, you know, I think you would expect us to lose to Man United, unfortunately. Yeah. I think what you're really seeing in the Premier League, you saw it at the weekend, is just these top teams are now so much better. Man City, Chelsea, Arsenal, uh, for me, the three standout teams. And, Sorry, Man, Man City, Man United, and Chelsea. Yeah, they are so much better now. Yeah, I was giving else. you a raised eyebrow there yeah, with Arsenal. Yeah, I think Arsenal are yeah, there. Two for very taking. quizzical looks. It's fine, <laughs> I mean, but they're they're just so much better, aren't they? The players they've got are so more. If you look at like Aguero, yeah, uh, Lukaku, you know, Morata, they, they're playing a. They're playing a different game to the game the yeah. Saints players. The Saints forward yeah. players are playing. So, I mean, it is interesting looking at that because. At the moment, I mean, they're clearly not untouchable because Saints did well against Man United and they could have got a result. But if you played that game over and over again 38 times in the season, you wouldn't expect it to be a very high finishing season, would would you, for Saints, if, if every game was against Man United? You, you'd be in trouble. They're looking really solid. They've got a real Mourinho second season look about them. Yeah. And they've bought really well, haven't they, Matic? And they've bought top, top, top. They're what winners. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, it's, it's funny with kind of Matic and um, uh, Juan Mata kind of bossing around the midfield and the way how Man United were really tight at the back. You start, they're actually starting to look a bit like Mourinho's really good Chelsea side. Even Phil Jones looks good. So God help all of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On, on some days, Phil Jones looks good. He still seems to fall over every once in a while. Yeah. yeah. Stoke has a, a special performance of him. He's got yeah. a silly face. <laughs> So anyway, I mean, I'd, I'm not too disappointed that we lost against Man United. I think um, that goal probably shouldn't have stood. But let's face it, as Saints fans, we know very, very well that Manchester United get decisions. And unfortunately, to beat Man United, you have to be that much better against them. You have to be able to kind of ride your luck a bit. You have to be able to 
be strong enough that they can't bully you and, and get favorable decisions. Um, one of the things which really stood out for me um, at St. Mary's Day was the atmosphere. The Saints fans just went for it. It was much, much better. You, you could just hear them the whole way through the game. It sounded much more positive. I think they, they feed off the players. I think Pelle, yeah. you know, Pellegrino, when he came in, he said, you know, the players need to give the fans a reason to be excited and to be proud. And I, I think, by all accounts, on Saturday, they did that. I don't think anyone begrudges them losing 1-0 at home to May United. Mm. It's the manner in which they lose. Yeah. You know, the Watford game was that case in point. And, and quite telling that they got applauded off the pitch uh, as well at, at St Mary's, you know, which doesn't always happen when you lose at home. Particularly in the run of form they've had at yeah. home. Um, so we've got a pretty favourable run of fix- fixtures coming up. So we've got... Yeah, we've been saying that all season, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> and, well, I mean, I, it probably has been the easiest start to a season you could ever ask for. Um, and you know, looking at the next five games, if you're an optimist, you'd fancy Saints to win every single one of those. I mean, if, if you're based in reality, you know that's that's not going to happen. But we've got Stoke away. So I mean, they're in terrible form at the moment. Really, I mean, they lost what four 0 at home to Chelsea. Yeah, Chelsea are a different gravy, but Stoke look all over the place. Yeah, I mean, they are the only team to have got a point against Man United, though. <laughs> Um, we have Newcastle United, um, West Brom, Brighton and Burnley. So Stoke, Newcastle, West Brom, Brighton, Burnley. Uh, an international break in the middle of that. I mean, that's we've got to be looking at this being the point where we, where we start getting some goals. You know, we, we've got to stop having these really embarrassing goal of the month competitions at Saints where... It's like, junior, <laughs> like, it's like the junior, like the tea yeah, lady. Exactly. You have, you have one... Uh, first team goal and then like here's our under 12s playing um you know as it it's nice to see the youngsters coming through but it would be quite nice if we could have at least three goals in a month so, um to choose from actually if we because the the west ham game was in august right yeah so at the moment for september it it is a one horse race yeah, but you haven't for, seen for the goal goals the that the uh, under 18s have been scoring james that's that's the issue <laughs> I okay. say what you should see the under seven girls team is cracking you in. So you know, watch out for those. We should we should sub one on. Um, but in all seriousness, do we think that this run of not scoring is going to come to an end, or is it? Or is are we kind of now becoming one of these solid but unspectacular sides? Is this the way how Saints? You know, is is the reason that we've gone for Puel and Pellegrino who? Let's face it, both kind of very similar styles of managers. If you look at what Pellegrino achieved at Alaves last season, finished eighth or ninth in the league, got to the cup final um, and only scored 40-something goals. And it's the same with Saints under Puel. So it wasn't really, you know, much of a change of personnel in terms of like necessary what that it wasn't like suddenly bringing in. It's not, not like going from a Frank de Boer to a Roy Hodgson, for example. It's not a cultural shift. No. No, I I think our culture is we're going to have defenders as managers. We're going to be tight at the back. We're always going to play two defensive midfielders and we're not going to concede goals. And as long as that keeps Southampton in the Premier League, I think it keeps Les Reed in a job. And and we'll, we'll carry on. I mean, hopefully we'll get a manager that also gets the scoring goals at the other end of the pitch. Is that our level of ambition now, though? Have the Saints board and Les Reed and whoever looked at it and gone, the top six is basically impenetrable. Um, we could, yeah. you know, spaff a lot of money on big na- name players and probably end up seventh or eighth, or we could probably end up seventh or eighth playing a really, really solid but unspectacular game. I think they want to win things. I do. And I think that they will think that, um, you know, these big clubs can have off seasons. They can have off days. Liverpool are mercurial. Um, Everton, are, you know, proven themselves to not be, be as strong as people thought. Um, it, I think that they're the, I think it's such a psychological thing. I think that once the players start scoring, they will keep scoring. I think, I think there's that. I think we've, 
bought badly when we needed to buy well. Look at mm. Buffal. You know, I don't think we we've signed these. We've signed. If you think like the three mercurial playmakers we've signed over the last five years in um, Chappy. Uruguayan chap who played for us, who I can't remember the name of, Ramirez, um, Osvaldo, yeah, and Buffal, yeah, and they've none of them have really done it, no. So, no, they signed some bad players, yeah, they, they, they've all been quite disappointing, actually, those players. Um, but anyway, so let, let's, do, let's do some predictions. So, we're traveling to the potteries on Saturday. We what? actually might be travelling as well. Yeah, I mean, we've... You can sort this out. It's, it's, it's 25 quid for an away ticket. That's cheaper than the normal £30, which I always think... I, I love going to the away games because 30 quid a ticket just makes me feel so happy. It makes yeah. makes a big difference. You get a train here for £26, just saying. Yeah. Um, and are we going there thinking that we're going to win? Uh, yeah. Why not? I I want us to score two goals from open oh my play. God, can you imagine the scenes? <laughs> God, tear, that was... tear the potteries to pieces. That that, that would be that, that would be twelve pound fifty per goal if we scored two goals from open play. Saints ROI is. I, I get the checkbook out yeah. now. <laughs> I wouldn't even want yeah. to go. I'd pay twelve pound fifty. I can listen to it at home on Saints yeah. player. Yeah, and I th- yeah, I think we can score two goals against them. I'll probably be Stoke and score score some header or something. Yeah, and or like you know a stup- It'll be really windy, and their goalkeeper will kick it in or something. But yeah, I think I think we can go there and beat them. Let's I mean, go two one. If you look at the the games they've played, I mean they they drew well against Man United, but they also lost away at Newcastle when Newcastle yeah. were actually really poor. Uh, Bristol City in the cup. Well, let's you know we can't really talk there. Lost heavily at home to Chelsea. Yeah, they're there to the Stoke are there to be beaten. Yeah. Um you know, lost to Everton. I you know, they they can be beat. Um so you two are both going for a win. I always go for a win. Yeah. I'm I'm gonna go for a score draw. But I'm not gonna expect us to score as many as two goals in the game. So I'm gonna go for a one one. Peter Crouch scoring. That will definitely happen. I mean, I'm going to yeah. on that, as, as I called that, that he would score at St. Mary's on the last day of last season, and he, of course he did. Um, and then let's have a goal from someone, you know, why not Nathan Redmond? Finally, he's going to put it in the back of the net. And so, yeah, that's it. I'm going to go for 1-1. Mind you, I'd, I'd still be happy to go along and watch that. Whilst we're on the subject of Stoke City, may I bring up, one of the players that we have shared, because I was reading about this recently in a book, and it was Rory Delap. So we've just talked about some of our, you know, most uh, expensive signings. Rory Delap at one point was record, Saints' yeah. record signing. Is that Derby County? Yeah, from Derby County, I think for I can't four million it was. It was a lot of money back yeah. then, and so it used to be that you go to Stoke and you just basically. Uh, be defending against a barrage of Rory de Lapp throw-ins. And, but he was good at taking throw-ins at, at, at Stoke, and he wasn't very good at taking throw-ins for us. I mean, he could throw the ball a long distance, but when he got to Stoke, they somehow managed to like launch the ball in really, really fast and really, really direct, and they used to get loads of goals from it. I don't remember a Rory de Lapp throw-in ever ending up with a goal for Saints. No, I, I, well, I remember, I remember a worldie once. I remember one time I find it. I was at we played Arsenal. Arsenal were excellent at this point. It was a long time ago. Sorry, it was a long time ago. Arsenal were excellent. And we were awful. I think it might have been the season we got relegated. Um but and we had so we had, had an awful start to the season. It was about October, November, and we we played Arsenal at Highbury and we had odds of 13 to 1 just to win the game and yeah. so I went down to the bookies that day and said okay 13 to 1 I'll take that and I'll, and then um, Thierry Henry Delap scored 2 yeah and then Thierry Henry scored in the last minute and, and ruined, ruined it yeah. and I cried well I didn't cry in the bookies but <laughs> the bookie laughed that's for sure I just want to say just quickly looking at Rory Delap's uh, Wikipedia page it says a midfielder by trained by trade he was renowned for his long throwing ability 
If you ever play, it was damned by faint praise. It's, it's that line there, isn't it? Yeah. He is definitely the trebuchet of um, of football players. Who the hell's trebuchet? Trebuchet is a, a medieval castle ballista. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we are going. Sorry, it's, it's like an nerd. Age of Empires yeah. re- game reference here. Oh my here. god, full nerd. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I clearly do not have the intellect to be sat in between <laughs> you two. But he was, he, you know, he was a very, he was a, he was part of that classic Premier League era of players that were just like, you know, they would never be allowed now. A player like Roy that have just a very functional footballer who was just very good do, at his job. But don't you love how, how kind of like back in the early era of the Premier League, and, and in fact, you know, I used to love watch going to watch um, lower league football as well. My brother and I used to go and watch Bristol Rovers and Bath City quite a lot because we grew up in Bath. And you have those players that would just have one sensational skill and the rest of their game was completely hopeless. I mean, do you remember Andy Tilson, who played for Bristol Rovers, who could head the ball the entire length of the pitch and used to yeah. warm up practising that? Yeah, yeah, I do remember that. I think he once hit me with a long ball with as a, well. With a long header? No, I don't think it was a long head. I think yeah. it was a long ball, but it was it was painful. This is interesting. So Rory Dalat was a former schoolboy javelin champion. <laughs> well, that really explains it all. <laughs> this is incredible. That must be a Wikipedia he's joke, could, right? Uh, no, it's true. He, he's, his uh, furrows could reach 30 to 40 metres, up to 131 foot, averaging... Uh, sp- it could reach a speed of 37 miles an hour. That's a fast car. Yeah, is is that that is on a Wikipedia page, right? That's what you're That's reading. W- I mean, Wikipedia is always true, so um, <laughs> I don't know what your issue is with that. Um, it's just phenomenal. We we need to see if we can get Rory Delap on this podcast, don't we? And ask Loved him. It. Just, you know, and we could take take him down to the park and see how far he could throw a ball for yeah. us. And we could all just relive that spectacular overhead kick he scored for us once. That was a great. I mean, I've just been looking at that now. It's phenomenal. Yeah. Um. So. Let's let, so we let's let's move on from uh, Rory de Lapp and his thrones and his javelin <laughs> prowess. Um, we're expecting good stuff against Stoke. We've got Newcastle at home. Do you think we're going to beat Newcastle at home? We really should beat Newcastle at home. I I mean I have a th- I have this theory about any team from the northeast and they're coming down our way. It's basically. For for some clubs, that's like a trip in Europe, you know. They yeah, should. So like Maccabi, <laughs> Tel Aviv or somewhere, <laughs> somewhere far away. You know, and so, and Newcastle, they, I mean, they have won games, but they also have lost games. And I really do think they should, they should definitely lose to us. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And also they've got a really bad record at our place, haven't they, where we've consistently given them a showing. Yeah, well, I mean, I think James has hit the nail on the head there that, that Newcastle always do terribly at Southampton. Yeah. And um, the the game's televised as well, I think. Brilliant. So, um, you know, uh, probably my most uh, fond memory of a Southampton home game against Newcastle televised was Matthew Letizia's incredible brace oh, in the mid-90s. I with a street chest of World Adventures and watch that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we then have West Brom at home. Again, I think... You know, this this is this is maybe the potential banana skin in that run of five fixtures. I could see Jay Rodriguez getting a, oh. a goal here. Um, Tony Pulis shutting up shop, perhaps losing one nil at home to West Brom. I don't, don't you make an annual pilgrimage to St Mary's to watch Saints versus West Brom, expecting seen, us to win? Yeah, it's one of my things. Uh, Danny Fox gets sent off. I think yeah. Ramirez and Fox getting sent off, and us losing three nil at home to West Brom was the highlight. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, terrible every time awful I just, I just shouldn't go and we'll probably do fine okay so Tom's banned from that fixture we've then got Brighton away um, which I think we owe them one for the championship yeah, that time definitely. they robbed us and then we've got Burnley at home we've, we've got to take a lot of points from this haven't we three home fixtures the two away ones Stoke and Brighton we should come out of this and be in European positioning shouldn't we you've got to hope so because uh, also because this is it Yeah, I don't think we can rely on being Man City or Arsenal or Chelsea or Spurs, these are the games we've got to win them. Yeah, yeah. Suddenly we're gonna, our fixture list is gonna change, and it's gonna be all all top teams rather than the rest. And we need to actually put these points on the on the board. Yeah, get well, them on the table. I mean, after Burnley, from the middle of November, you've then got Liverpool, Everton, Manchester City. It's a run of three fixtures, which would be tough. You know, I think you know we we know that we can take points against Liverpool and, and Everton and. You know, who knows? Maybe Guardiola's Man City won't be 
firing on all cylinders by then that we could do with a little bit of a blip but it's it's going to be a tough run in from about the middle of november to new year it's I mean, going to be much to be tougher up, right? yeah. we, need, we need to be uh, we, we need to have some wriggle room don't we yeah it's comfortably secure by sort of early december otherwise it's going to be squeaky bomb time right so we know it's important we know we need to score goals let's get on to the next thing which um is a question i put out to our followers on twitter and um it's one that bt sport asked me to respond to on their kind of like saturday football show which you may have seen me doing little 20 second bite-sized chunks for (laughs) Um, so i asked who do you think is saint's most underrated player past or present um and before we go for the listener suggestions tom and james i want you to give me your votes i uh instinctively went for matt oakley a very uh, cultured very uh consistent not a great goal scorer um probably a bit like steven davis actually like very clever uh with the ball very very good with the ball did score mm. probably enough goals for someone of his talent but yeah like i just always thought he was really good and incredibly he only retired something like a year or so ago he's clearly like a vampire who just didn't age um but it was a really good servant for saints i don't know how many how many games he played um but yeah very good player and also now has a vineyard he has a vineyard yeah or a wine in point business something like that he's in he's in vino tech culture oh um so i mean matt oakley played for southampton for over 10 years he was there for a long time and normally if you play over 10 years for a club you don't then expect to go on and then play another 300 or so games with the rest of your career, do you? But, I mean, that's what that's what he did. He, he's made 614 career appearances after Southampton, over 50 for Derby, 137 for Leicester City, and then over 150 for Exeter City as well. Captain consistency. Um, 261 appearances, 14 goals. Yeah, it kind of proves my point. I mean, he played that break, you know, with Matty and Al Berkovic and Edgar Lawson and that and all the, you know, some some very good players in the time. But um, yeah, just a really good, solid player. James? Um, I'm going to go for something, someone a bit random and obscure. I'm going to go for Hammond from our, our, our three years three years from League One to the, to the Premier League choice, that is. <laughs> where he he really did play well for us and then we got to the Premier League and he just fizzled out instantly like I think we might have even sold in the season we went up I think it was part of that brutal you're not good Br- enough yeah I think we did catch you and and I thought he was I thought he was really good when, when he played for us he was always creating chances and he was a, he was a good captain for us as well wasn't he yeah, I mean, he he did really well at Saints. He had over 100 appearances for us um, in that time. And I think he returned to Brighton where he'd started his career at. Yeah. So he started at Brighton, um, ended up at Southampton and went back to Brighton after we got promoted. Um, and lost his captaincy to Adam Lalana as well. He was part of that time where we uh, did a bit of an AC Milan thing where we just went and found all the best players that could possibly sign for us and sign them, like Fonte and Ricky Lambert and yeah. Hammond. And Spending a million pounds in League One. Yeah. The unthinkable. We went big. Um, but yeah, good player, good choice. Um, can I just have one other, which uh, kind of sad story, but Dean Richards. Yeah. yeah. What a player Dean Richards could have been. And obviously, tragically, life cut short, you know, much bigger than football, but... Again, like a very classy, very probably a bit ahead of his time for a centre back. Yeah, you know, like a centre back that would now be quite natural, really lauded, wouldn't he? Yeah, but then he, he was a bit clever. But but then I don't know with Dean Richards because he did get his big transfer, didn't he, it's to first, to Tottenham yeah, Hotspur? Yeah. Um, and I remember being really really upset about that at the time. Uh, he always feels, I don't know. Like losing a player to Tottenham doesn't feel like quite a big enough step up <laughs> in my mind. Um, but I, so Dean Rich is obviously a fantastic culture player. Tragic um, for him to lose his life so early. But I don't know if he falls into the category of underrated player because I think he was very well rated and he did get his 
his big money transfer. I think to be an underrated player, you almost have to kind of drop down after Saints rather than, you know, perhaps moving up um, to the next. So, I mean, should I go through some of the suggestions we've had from our listeners? So, um, uh, Lee Callender actually went for Matty Oakley along with you, Tom. Great minds. Yeah. Thanks, Lee. Uh, Lee Payne, keeping with the Lee theme, went for Stephen Davis, who we've talked about a lot. Um, you know, he's been a first team player under the past five managers, Lee yeah. pointed out, which is which is true. Uh Truckosaurus, real name. Real name. <laughs> uh went for Papa Wigo. Interesting. From the sort of uh, what was that that was the cup we won the uh, the, the Johnson's Paint Trophy. Paint yeah, trophy the yeah. Alan right. Pardew season. What who what or who was Papa Wigo? It sounds like something from Legal Gentleman. Wasn't he? Is he the one that we signed from? We were in League One, and we signed a player from Fiorentina. Was it? This could be good knowledge. This, uh, James, yeah. you've totally. Know. We had him on loan yeah. from Fiorentina. Yeah, thirty-five appearances, five goals. Um, he's only thirty-three now. So, ooh, I don't know. That was kind of like early to mid twenties. And he was one of these players where you, we were in League One, so we didn't have. We still played through the international break, and we had a player that went went abroad, went away, and played for well, their we country. Had all English players, all like British players. And then we had a is it Senegal international. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it is. It's interesting because Papuago was on a season long loan. We had an option to buy him, and we didn't take him up. So, I mean. Although uh, Mr. Truckosaurus might rate him, obviously. Well, that, I mean, that was Alan Pardew, so wasn't it? Yeah, the, so the, Alan other player from the, the other player from that season that I really do think we, when, when he played for us for that season, he was amazing. And I was like, why didn't, why didn't we sign this player? That's and Antonio. now he plays, no, yeah, now he plays, we can't tell you. plays for West Ham and bangs them in. And so. Yeah, that, that, that was a big missed opportunity. Um, Tim Kerrily suggests Ken Moncal. We know he's a he's a friend of the podcast. Yeah, I like Ken, but again, I mean, is he an underrated player? Did he ever get any Dutch caps? I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know if he did. I mean, maybe he wasn't rated by the Dutch uh, national side so much. I mean, they had some they had some players. Didn't yeah, they? Like, let's be honest, the Dutch at the time. Um, yeah, good player though. Very good player. Um, Ian P uh, goes for Jason Dodd, another oh. friend of the podcast. Yeah, I, I agree. He's he's great, and he's play he plays and he's played right back for Southampton for what fourteen, fifteen, sixteen yeah. years. He's from season. Bath, which is a great asset to have. Yeah, I went to the same school as him. Yeah, oh, it's it's great. Yeah. Oh, I'm getting he, he, getting dizzy. And also great work with the youth team as well. Yeah, Saints. and scores from corners. Yes, which yeah, yeah useful skills. Have. Oh, that's so, great. I I love that one. I had a, I had a broken leg. I was. Com- I didn't have the right cast on my leg. This is like two weeks after I'd broken my leg. Playing rugby, obviously. Awful sport. And and I had the wrong cast on my leg. So my bone was actually flexing within its cast. So I was in absolute agony. And then I think two days before we went to this game, we went back to the doctor. And the doctor gave me some amazing pills. Yeah. So I didn't feel anything. And so there's some footage on Match of the Day where if you look closely behind that goal where he scored that Tom, corner, get up. I was I was jumping up and down on one leg with my crutches, having a whirl of a time. And then and then suddenly realised where I was and had to sit so back. Jason down Dodd scoring from a corner against Portsmouth. If you want to see what James looks like in real life, he's the man with crutches and a cast on his leg celebrating uh, the corner against. Oh, uh, I better be Hombie. actually in this. Well, that's not. That's definitely no. match the day footage. Right, we'll listen? look it up and tweet it or something. Yeah. Um, Martin Rogers went for another friend of the podcast, David Armstrong. Yeah, how many? Yeah, what a hero! I mean, David Armstrong. Uh, I never saw uh, play in person, but you know, I read his book. I've read all about his career and. I mean, he sounded like a you know, really, really fantastic player and such a lovely guy. Um, Richard Channel goes for Kelvin Davis. Interesting. Yeah. I, mean, well, I think with 
Kelvin Davis, one of my fondest memories was actually when he came back when Fraser Forster got injured against Burnley with a terrible injury. And, and Kelvin Davis came on and everyone was like, oh my God, Kelvin Davis is like, Hobbit, he's like 38,000 years old. <laughs> he was just amazing. Yeah. Um, and Steve Mullins went for Marion Pahars. I'm not allowing that. It's not underrated. It's, he's not underrated, is he? He's everyone's favourite. I mean, everyone called him the Latvian Michael Owen. Yeah. That That is rated. Yeah, definitely. Um, sorry, Stevie. We've been a little bit blasé there, but um, Marion Pahars was, was very well rated. Now, Billy Bowden and Richard Bereton both agreed with me that Saints' most underrated player is Chris Marsden, football genius. The name surely tells you that he's not, because everyone loves Chris Marsden. Yeah, but ev- everyone at Southampton loves Chris Marsden. Mm. But he suffered from looking rather unexceptional as a human being. Like, you know, the bald heads, you know, kind of injury. Like his watching figure- the actually, that game, yeah. And he's he's there. Yeah, he didn't look right, did he? Chris Chris Marsden didn't look like um, a glamorous football player, let's say. And and actually, I was just looking back at his stats. He only ever scored six goals for Southampton, but I seem to remember every single one of them as these kind of like beautiful, silkily, you know, dribbled around several players and, and put it into the net. I, I find it astonishing that he only scored six out of over a hundred and twenty appearances for Saints. Yeah, I think he's great. I mean, was how many did he score against Chelsea in that game? Was that was that two or three? Because that was that was a beautiful game. That was definitely the the <laughs> pinnacle of his career in anyone's view. Um, we're gonna have to look that up. Tom, can you give me your favourite Chris Marsden uh, memory whilst I look up how yeah, many goals he scored 110%. in one game? No doubt what it is. Last game of the Dell. I was there, I don't know if I've mentioned that before, probably about a few thousand times. <laughs> uh, sat in the Arsenal end, Matty scores his goal, everyone goes absolutely nuts, I cry. A few minutes later, the forgotten bit of history is that Chris Marsden shoots an unbelievable half volley on the snap, uh, hits it so brilliantly, David Seaman, or no, it, wasn't, it was like Alex Manninger, I think, just about managers to tip it over the bar, everyone goes nuts because no one wanted Chris Marsden for the last goal <laughs> of the Dell. So it was like this great moment of like what could have been. Uh, but yeah, no, great. That was the best moment of something he never did. Um, but I think my favourite Chris Marsden goal was, and I just have to think if I'm remembering this right, was when we played against, I think it was Tranmere Rovers. And we won something like 6-0 or 6-1. And yeah, 6-1. And I just remember him perhaps, you know, dribbling it around the entire Tramia team within about 30 seconds of the game starting and just putting the ball straight in the net. And, and that was great. Yeah, it's, I mean, one minute, great. I mean, that, and it's also, also it's like, a dem- it's exactly the way you want to start a cup game against an awful side. You don't want a <laughs> moment of nerves. You just want your first player to touch the ball, to pick it up and just go, all right, I'm just going to go past you, 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 and put it in the back of the net and show you all up for being not the quality that we are. And looking at that game, uh, Brett Ormond got a hat trick. Uh, another friend of the... Po- he was He was another one of the... He would be a good shout for most underrated player as well. Very honest. Yeah. Very honest. Lovely guy as well. Not long ago, but it does feel like a completely different generation of footballer. Yeah. Right. Anyway, I think we've done enough reminiscing for an evening. Should we uh, call it a day here, lads? That's fair, I think. Yeah. yeah. Remember, if you want to get in touch with the uh, with the podcast, um, tweet us at Saints FC Podcast on Twitter. Let us know who your most underrated player is. Give us any shouts for any kind of little features you'd like us to bring up on, on Saints anytime in the future. Um, you can email us saintsfcpodcast at gmail.com or you can just go on to the iTunes store and give us a wonderful review. Remember... If you've enjoyed listening to the Saints FC podcast, please tell all of your Saints supporting friends to give us a listen. Um, We would appreciate that. Anyway, it's cheerio from me. It's uh, it's goodbye from Tom. And goodbye from me. There you go. Cheerio, everyone.